I am here with uh, Professor Anjan Chakravarti, who is a uh, philosopher of science and uh, the Apinyani Foundation Chair at the University of Miami. Uh, Professor Chakravarti has written extensively on a number of questions in the philosophy of science, um, uh, including scientific ontology, scientific realism, and uh, he's currently working on issues of humanism. Uh, so thanks a lot for being here, uh, Anjan. Maybe since you're a philosopher of science, I'll begin by asking you how you see your role as a philosopher of science and more broadly, how you see the relationship between philosophy and science. Sure. Well, first of all, Tarun, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I think the, uh, the role of a philosopher of science is changing in interesting ways now. I think in the last couple of decades, uh, philosophers who had grown accustomed to speaking only to one another in the cloisters of academia uh, have been thinking more and more about uh, reaching out beyond the confines of academia, in part because of the, the very different, difficult existential crises that we face in the world. And I think philosophers of science are very well placed to try to articulate uh, what's important about science, how it can help us with some of these problems, which I suppose is a nice way of getting to what it is that I see myself doing in the philosophy of science. My interests uh, have always been focused on very central questions in the philosophy of science having to do with what scientific knowledge is exactly. Uh, I think there's a, uh, a simple view, a naive view that we might have about this, that of course scientists are just uncovering truths about the way the world works, the natural world, the social world. Uh, but of course, the more you know about science, you know that uh, this picture is complicated by all of the complexities of actually investigating things and discovering that things are not as simple as you initially thought they might be. And when we factor in the fact that over time, if you look back at the history of the sciences and where it may be going in the future, what we take to be scientific knowledge actually evolves and changes and grows and drops things off. And so trying to think about what scientific knowledge is exactly in what ways is it true? In what ways is it a, a working hypothesis that we're hoping to improve? Uh, how should we think about knowledge in different domains of the sciences and what relevance they may have for some of these problems that we're facing today that philosophers might help to articulate to the public? These are all things that I'm interested in and see as part of my job as a philosopher of science. So do you think then that the job of a philosopher of science is to serve more as a kind of liaison between science and the public, or do you think that philosophers of science have something to contribute that maybe scientists should be paying attention to as well? I think that there are certainly things that we can collaborate on, philosophers on the one hand and scientists on the other. And those things actually go beyond communicating with the public, although I think that that is one very important thing that we can do. Mm -hmm. So philosophers uh, are, I think, relatively new uh, to the game of trying to speak to people outside of their own departments, to their own students, to their own colleagues. They're used to speaking to people in very specialized ways with specialized jargon. And of course, when you approach the public, you need to rethink how you present all of these things in ways that are accessible and will be uh, you know, well understood by a broader audience. And I think the scientists have had a head start on this for quite some time because scientists have always, I think, seen as part of their job the articulation of uh, what they're doing and what sort of knowledge they're uncovering uh, to uh, a wider swathe of the public. That said, I think that often when scientists present their work to the public, they do so in ways that uh, maybe gloss over some of the complexities of the sciences, um, some of the uh, distinctions that we uh, and they, for that matter, take seriously about how certain we are about certain aspects of our best theories and models. Are some parts more speculative? Are others more solid? I think often they're used to communicating in a certain vein, which is to present the results of science as though these are the ultimate truths of the universe. And I think that one way in which uh, philosophers and scientists might helpfully collaborate is to add some nuance to that description to prevent present a more realistic picture to the public, which I think will serve all of us well, because when we represent scientific knowledge as though it's infallible, and then it turns out that 
maybe we need to improve our view or conduct another experiment or do something differently to improve the state of our knowledge that might even generate skepticism within the public. So I think a collaboration of that kind. So you had mentioned that um, there's something about the movement we're in right now, which makes the kind of collaboration you're talking about and also the public role that you said philosophers are now adopting makes that more pressing. So could you say a little bit more about that? What is it about the condition we're currently in that calls for this kind of work? Well, I think there are uh, a few things. Um, sadly, they seem to be taking the form of very serious existential crises. Uh, the uh, pandemic, mm -hmm. I think, was a very interesting and, of course, terrible episode in the lives of many people over the last few years and really put on display uh, the workings of science in a way that I think the public was not entirely prepared to understand. When the pandemic first started, uh, there was uh, a scramble among scientists to try to work out what the best ways of responding to it might be. At that stage of research, things were quite speculative and scientists were doing their best with the limited data they had. Uh, later on, as the pandemic wore on, we had acquired more information, more data. We were able to formulate uh, better and better uh, kinds of advice for how we might behave to lessen our risk of infection and so on and so forth. And I think many people in the public took that to suggest that the sciences don't know what they're doing. You said one thing uh, six months ago, you're saying something else now. Who knows what you're going to say in another six months? So I think that presents a kind of object lesson in how important it is uh, to be able to communicate in a way that really conveys the state of our knowledge at any given time and to communicate the sense in which the sciences are always our best bet, even if we think that the state of our knowledge is something that will improve over time. That's just one example. The other obvious example uh, that people are very much uh, concerned about these days is climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I've come to you from Miami, where the sea level is getting uncomfortably close to the bottoms of everyone's houses. And uh, so this is on our minds, uh, I think, across the globe. And there are you know, very, I think, robust predictions to the effect that if we don't attempt to get on top of it very soon, using our best science, um, we're going to be in massive, massive amounts of trouble. And yet climate science is actually uh, a very complicated area. Anyone who's seen a weather forecast will know that. There are lots of different forecasts. There are lots of different paths that a storm might take, and modeling in this area is actually quite a complex endeavor. So again, being able to articulate these things in ways that do justice to the science, but also communicate in reassuring ways to the public is, I think, very important. So it seems like there's a, there's a sort of dilemma here, um, which I think you were pointing out that often the reason why distrust in science develops under conditions like the pandemic is because people work with a kind of unrealistic picture of science, right? They, 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 if sci they, they believe that if scientists are saying something, then this is an expression of certainty. And then if it turns out that, you know, things have changed, then that leads to this idea that, look, were they lying to us or something like this, right? Um, and so one potential way out of this is to educate people more broadly on how uncertainty works in science. Um, but on the other hand, often what happens is when you present uncertainty is that people who are interested in casting doubt on science latch on to that uncertainty as an indication that the science does it, scientists don't know what they're talking about or something. So have you thought at all about how one would resolve this dilemma in terms of how to present uh, science to a broader audience? I have thought about this question, uh, although not as carefully as some who are, I think, really trying to intervene in serious ways on uh, what we might call the public understanding of science, mm -hmm. uh, where this dilemma that you mentioned is very pressing. Um, and this kind of research is really social science research into thinking about how to express messages that will be taken up by the public in the right sorts of ways to understand concepts of certainty and uncertainty mm -hmm. and how this need not generate skepticism and so on and so forth. My own thoughts about this have been targeting uh, an earlier stage really in the education of people. There's a sense in which, and I hate to sound pessimistic about it, but when people get to a certain stage, a certain adult stage, 
and have very fixed ideas about uh, the trustworthiness or not of the sciences, uh, we're really fighting an uphill battle to try to educate people at that stage. And it's not that it shouldn't be done, but it is difficult. My own interests have been trying to focus on what a general science education might look at an earlier stage, when I think we're in a much better position to try to uh, communicate to uh, you know, younger students information about how to understand science. And there, I think, there's a lot of work to be done, actually, because the, the reigning paradigms of how we should teach sciences in a general education, and by general education, I mean not to specialists, you know, someone who will go on to become a physicist or a biologist, but someone who may go on to do something entirely different, but will take a course or two in the sciences. I think a lot of our education has been focused on just trying to teach them as much science as we can. Um, in other cases, it's been to teach them a little bit about how science works, to do the kind of work that in my field we identify with the history and philosophy of science. And I think that those are both excellent things to do and we should do them. But I don't think that's the way to produce citizens that will ultimately have a better public understanding of science. I think what we need to do at earlier stages is to really demonstrate to students the amazing problem-solving capacities of the sciences. Because even though there are a lot of disagreements in philosophy, as you know, about how we should interpret scientific knowledge, there's one thing that everyone agrees on. Even though scientists may sometimes disagree about how to interpret a theory that they're working on, there's one thing that they will definitely agree on, that we all agree on, and that is that the sciences are our best set of techniques for generating theories and models that are empirically successful, that make predictions that turn out to be true, that give us explanations of phenomena that help us to understand them better so that when the next pandemic hits, we may be better prepared. And that problem-solving capacity of the sciences is something that all of our philosophical and scientific interpretations of the sciences are built on. It's kind of a bedrock. And if we can instill that in people to realize that whatever the state of science at any given time, it may be at an early stage, it may be at a later stage, the sciences are always our best bet for generating the kinds of tools and techniques we need to solve the problems that confront us. I think that should actually be the basis of a general science education. Something that uh, you've been working on recently and that is also, as I understand it, part of the mission of your know, chair at the university is uh, humanism. So could you maybe explain to us uh, what humanism is exactly? Sure. So humanism is, uh, it's actually more difficult, I think, to say what humanism is than to say what science is or to say what philosophy is. And even those are hard questions. Uh, in part because uh, humanism is a worldview that has evolved over centuries. Uh, it has its roots, some people would say, in uh, antiquity, um, evolved through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, uh, right up until the present day. And there are different strands of this idea, and some of them end up saying things that sound somewhat different from one another. But I think the, the dominant strand and the one that I'm most interested in, uh, it's certainly the most dominant strand today, is one that sees the world in a certain kind of way. And that way is one that takes um, our reason, our capacity to think rationally, and the sciences as perhaps our most profound and our most successful exemplification of reason and rational thought as the kind of central pillars on which our understanding of the world should rest, and for that matter, our understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. Um, it's a worldview that combines this kind of special privileging of reason and science with uh, a commitment to thinking about how we might make the world a better place, to use these tools to actually um, improve the situation of not just ourselves, but of the rest of the sentient things in the world and the planet. Uh, and also to take action, to be involved in, once we've thought about how to make the world a better place, to engage ourselves in ethical and political projects that will actually bring these things about. So that's a lot to combine in one view, but humanism does have these uh, different dimensions, one having to do with reason and science, another having to do with 
um, how we think about ethical problems, and another to do with political action. So one concern that uh, is often raised when people uh, hear this kind of idea, and I think there's a strong tradition of this uh, in the last century, for example, being a little skeptical about a kind of imperialistic uh, notion of rationality or science, the idea that scientific rationality creeps into every corner of our lives, takes over aspects of our life that aren't meant to be scientized or rationalized, maybe. Uh, and often this is this I, I, the, the claim that science does have this power is, is labeled as scientism uh, pejoratively. Um, so do you have any uh, thoughts about that critique? Certainly, yeah. I think that that critique is um, something that we should take very seriously. And uh, one that we, you know, whose uh, power we should acquiesce to. I think it's important to understand what the sciences can do for us and what they can't. So in academic debates, as you know, in philosophy, uh, there are very strong uh, advocates of scientism. Uh, in debate, in fierce discussion with very strong advocates of uh, not holding to a scientist, uh, scientism type position. And those debates are I think interestingly academic in the sense that they don't play out very well in everyday life. Um, people who advocate scientism might say things like, uh, well, everything that there is to know is in principle studyable and knowable by the sciences. And that might include things like our values, um, our ethical behavior, are the sorts of things that people don't often discuss in terms of their favorite examples of science, you know. Newton, Galileo, and Darwin. And those debates are interesting, and I think they're important. But in everyday life, I think there's a, a kind of antidote to the, the worry that one might have that science is behaving imperialistically or trying to take over all of our discourse, right? Which is that, in practice, it can't, and it doesn't. So when we engage in questions about what the right course of action is, or how we should weigh competing interests in a society between different groups of people. Um, there are ways in which the sciences can help us to think about that by doing social science on what people think, on what they would prefer, on how we could bring about change. But they can't answer questions about what we should prefer and how we should weigh these diverging interests and ultimately um, you know, what sorts of policies we should adopt. So I think that while there is uh, a kind of fear of creeping scientism that the sciences may take over everything. In practice, they really can't because ultimately, you know, the human will and our preferences uh, and uh, moral judgments are not amenable to that kind of analysis in a practical setting. So would you say then that those, those questions you just referred to, questions about what we should do, uh, ethical, political questions, those kinds of questions, are there kind of separate from science? I mean, maybe science can help us understand the world better and that might help us figure out the best means to attain what we should. Um, but the ultimate question about where we should be aiming, do you think that's completely independent from science or do you think science can inform those values in some way? I think it's entirely possible that science could inform uh, those kinds of discussions in helpful ways. Right. Um, it may be that understanding better uh, the nature of our evolutionary development might help us to understand the kinds of environments, uh, both social and natural, in which we uh, might flourish, right? Um, that's one factor. Of course, when it comes to human beings and other animals of any sophistication, it isn't just biology that contributes to our uh, possibilities for well-being. It's our acculturation uh, and our education. Um, so the, the equation is very complex. Um, but even in those domains, those latter domains, I think research into how we learn, um, uh, what sorts of uh, styles of pedagogy are most effective for us, um, what sorts of things we are able to grasp well and what sorts of things we don't and how we might do better in cases where we don't, all of those things are relevant. So I think the sciences are certainly in a position to provide us with helpful information that will guide our thinking about these questions I just don't think that they're going to ultimately answer questions of, for example, uh, what we should value in contexts of morals. So the um, Azim Premji Foundation, the parent organization of the university, um, has 
done a lot of work in education in some ways that is the central focus of the foundation's activity um and so since you're here uh, i take the advantage of the opportunity to ask you how you think the kind of humanistic world you've been talking about one that emphasizes reason uh, and a scientific approach to questions um how that might inform how we educate uh, both children at a younger level and maybe at a higher educational level yeah. well i think the uh uh, the tenets of a humanist education uh, would embrace things that I think most people would be very supportive of, right? uh, as rich an understanding of our capacities for reasoning and rational thought and science as we can muster, um, an understanding of what it is to engage in uh, discussions about ethics, um, and action to bring about a better world. There's a commitment in the humanist worldview to thinking about those questions um, for the betterment of society, which I think as we look around the world today and see so many problems afflicting societies in terms of their cohesion and inability to act in a cohesive enough way to tackle some of the problems that are facing them. Um, a, a humanist education would favor all of those things. I mean, in in uh, in very simple terms, uh, it's an education that would focus on a lot of the values of the Enlightenment that people still hold in high regard today. Um, the extent to which they were exemplified in that period and the extent to which they've been exemplified in any period since, including today's, is certainly something that uh, one could take issue with. Uh, but as a series of ideals, I think, making that a part of our educational outreach uh, is something that I think most people would think is a good thing. So there is, uh, so you mentioned this kind of enlightenment idea that I think one idea underlying the enlightenment was this idea of cooperation across um, differences in culture, tradition, belief, um, cooperation grounded on our common capacity to reason. Um, and uh, there is, I think, now a kind of cynicism uh, in a lot of circles about this idea. Uh, uh, perhaps people look at the world today and arrive at a kind of pessimistic conclusion about the possibility of such cooperation. Um, do you have a more optimistic take on this? Or? Well, I like to my, think of myself as a realist. Okay. And you're absolutely right that there are times when you turn on the news and you see what's happening. And in various places, we are living with it ourselves. It's very hard to maintain any strong sense of optimism. It's easy to feel, I think a lot of people felt this during the pandemic, very pessimistic about our chances. One aspect of humanism that I've always found quite interesting is something that expressed among all of these people who are interested in reason and science and social cooperation and so on, is a kind of optimistic attitude that human capacities for reaching for a better world are within our grasp. It may be slow progress, it may be difficult, there may be setbacks, but that kind of optimism is built into the view. I've always found that interesting and puzzling myself because it's not something that can be grounded in anything other than the optimism of people. But I suppose uh, all we can do is to try our best and to return to the question of what a humanist education might look like. If we set students up to work with one another cooperatively and they see the fruits of that kind of interaction, I think there can be no better demonstration of what that kind of uh, cooperation can bring. So on that hopeful note, I think we should end this discussion. Thank you so much, Anjan, for joining me and for uh, the wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.